Thank you. Um, thanks for everyone for coming, and thanks for the organizers to the organizers for having me here. Um, so yes, today or this afternoon, I'm going to talk about an application of Replica Exchange Wang Lando, which we've heard about this week for in a few different cases. Um, and so what this is is it's a it's a model for protein folding. And so we also heard about that from Dr. Bachman a couple days ago. So tying both of those together is essentially what this talk will show you. Maybe. Oh. Okay, so an outline for the talk will be to first just give a bit of background to motivate the model. Um, so just a little bit of biochemistry. Um, I will then talk about the protein folding problem, so why we want to study this. And specifically, one approach to studying this, which is the use of lattice proteins. Um, I will then go into the methodology and talk briefly about Wang Landau sampling, as well as replica exchange Wang Landau sampling, but not a lot because we've already heard about it multiple times. And then I will talk about the Monte Carlo trial moves that we use in this study. I will then discuss some results and summarize and conclude with an outlook and a few questions for the future of the project. So for background, first thing to start with to understand this model is a bit about biochemistry. So amino acids are chemical structures that all contain certain chemical groups and certain atoms. Um, they have a central carbon atom, an alpha carbon, a hydrogen atom, carboxyl group, and an amino group. And then the last part is something called a residue group. And so the residue group is what distinguishes one amino acid from the other. So all the other chemical structures are the same, but the residue group is different. And we can link two amino acids through something called a peptide bond, where they will link, dehydrate, release a water molecule, and then this structure is now called a peptide. For all the amino acids, so the 20 naturally occurring amino acids, one way we can characterize these is, a, is according to their hydrophobicity or their desire to interact with water or, or stay away from water, so the environment that they're embedded in. So in this table, you can see that certain amino acids with their name and their abbreviation are more hydrophobic and others are more hydrophilic. So this is one way that we can break these up sort of nicely by their behavior. Um, if we, so we know that we know that amino acids are so sort of a fundamental building block, and so if we connect a couple amino acids, we get a peptide. If we connect more of these, we get a polypeptide, and then finally, at a certain number of these, we get a protein. So it's really a question of length scale, of how many amino acids we have, but the protein is formed by linking these amino acids together, and each protein is is uniquely defined by its sequence of amino acids. So certain proteins have different amino acids in different orders, and this defines which protein you have. These will then fold in a biological system, and their three-dimensional structure, their folded state, determines the role that they will play in the body. Um, and there are various roles, immune response, metabolism, all kinds of things that these, depending on the protein, depending on the structure, that they can carry out. Oops. So, um, what's the problem? So we heard, well, okay, so to start with, the, these proteins fold very quickly in the body. So they fold on the order of normally millisecond time scales. Um, given the vast number of degrees of freedom, uh, and thus the vast conformation space, it is uh, basically impossible that these things fold randomly. So there's some mechanism by which they fold so quickly. It's impossible that it could be purely random. So in 1973, Christian Anfinsen uh, carried out his famous experiment where he essentially concluded that the protein, the native state of the protein, the folded state, is determined by the amino acid sequence of the protein. So if we know the amino acid sequence, there's no reason we can't figure out, theoretically, the final folded structure. Um, but this has been sort of the topic of study in, in an uncountable amount of fields and, and 
papers, and we still don't know exactly how these things fold. So what we do know is that the free energy landscape is rough, as we've seen before this week, and that the protein, for small proteins, normally they fold in two steps, essentially. So first they're sort of a random coil. They will eventually, so unfolded, and then at a certain point they will form some sort of molten, sort of liquid globule. So it's sort of like a transition from a gas to a liquid, but not exactly. And then eventually they will sort of crystallize, solidify into some sort of um, native structure. So one problem is we don't, we, we don't know how they fold, and we also don't know what this reaction coordinate on the x-axis is. So what does, this what does this free energy landscape depend on? What changes the free energy over the folding? And there are algorithms to predict structures that are normally based on saying, well, this specific type of, this specific sequence of amino acids folds this way in this protein, and this one folds this way in this protein, so if we stitch these together, maybe we can get something that then the protein will fold to. But there's no generic algorithm to predict the structure. That's still an unanswered question. So one very coarse-grained approach to this problem, this is more coarse-grained than what we saw the other day, is to consider something called a lattice protein. And these are very simplified models, and what we do is that since we know the amino acids are what distinguishes, the, or the residue group of the amino acid is what distinguishes the amino acid, and the amino acid sequence makes up the protein, we can say, well, we're going to model each amino acid in a protein as a monomer based on the residue group. So if we have nine amino acids, a nine monomer chain, each one of these would represent a different amino acid, potentially. And then we can model this based on interactions between specific amino acids because we can characterize them in this way. And the, the benefit here is that now we can, we can define certain interactions. So we can define an interaction between, say, monomer 2 and 5, a non-bonded nearest neighbor interaction. Or we can define an interaction between parallel bonds or between bends in the protein or any way, anything we'd like that should be physically motivated. And the energy now is very easily calculated. So we can easily calculate the total energy of this configuration based on the interactions that we define. Um, so it is obviously more coarse-grained than continuum models, but we don't have to worry about empirical potentials. And we also don't have to worry about the long time scales associated with molecular dynamics folding. So that can work maybe for very short sequences, but once they get very long and complicated, it, it, it slows down too much to be realistic. So one famous model, I believe Ying Wai mentioned this briefly in her talk the other day, is called the HP model. And so what this is, is it was, in, it was invented by Ken Dill, who's actually a biochemist, there's some biochemistry behind this, even though it doesn't look like a protein. The idea here is that we take the amino acids, and instead of having 20 of them, we have two. And so we split these up according to hydrophobicity. So we have certain amino acids that are hydrophobic, so the gray ones, and then we have certain amino acids that are hydrophilic or polar, as I will refer to them from now on. And so we can now define, we know that in a, in a folded uh, protein, the hydro the f it forms a hydrophobic core. So the polar monomers shield the hydrophobic ones from the environment. And so we have a sort of knowledge-based Hamiltonian where we consider the total energy of the system as just the number of HH contacts, NHH, where an HH contact is a non-bonded nearest neighbor contact. And we can define some interaction energy. And that's up to us, right? Epsilon HH is some number. And so then the total energy of the system is just given by the number of HH contacts times the interaction energy that we define. And as the protein folds now, because of this, at the ground state, the protein will have a folded uh, hydrophobic core. So the, yes, we consider the state with the, with the lowest energy to be the native state. The problem, though, is that this is so coarse-grained that the ground state is often highly degenerate. And so this is in contrast to what we expect or what we see in nature. So for even the smallest proteins, we see a degeneracy on the order of 10 to the fifth 
for the ground state. So in this particular model, we only consider, so epsilon HH is just a number, but the H, yeah, so HH indicates that we're only considering this to be, so say it's one. So we consider it to be one unit of energy for each HH contact. So the problem here is the, okay, before I continue, this, the finding the ground state of a HP sequence is an NP complete problem. And it's been studied in other fields, computer science and statistics, as an optimization problem. So it's biochemically inspired as it was invented, but it's useful for other, serves other purposes. It's an algorithmic test bed as well. But if we go back to the biochemistry side, the problem with the original model is the degeneracy. So the ground state is very degenerate, and that's unphysical. So one extension that we made was to say instead of, so we further split the amino acid scale. So instead of saying, well, we only have two monomers, hydrophobic and polar, let's introduce a third. So let's break some of the symmetry associated with just a two monomer system. And so we introduced something called a neutral monomer, which is somewhere in between very hydrophobic and very polar. And we split the scale. And we can now also consider a weaker interaction between neutral and hydrophobic monomers. So now our Hamiltonian is the same as before with the number of HH contacts times their interaction energy, and then minus the number of HO contacts times their interaction energy. And we can define these interaction energies as we wish. The relative scale between them is what matters. Yes? So you could do that. This was just the first thing that we thought to do. So because if you had a, with an O with a P, you, you, we could, in, in theory, define an interaction between an H and an H, an H and an O, an H and a P, an O and a P, an O and an O, so forth. This was just originally done for, for simplicity, just to start. More questions? So the next step is now to introduce what we did. Instead of defining different interactions between O's and H's and so, or, H, or O's and P's and so forth, is we said, well, let's consider some sort of bending restraint. And so we know, as we saw the other day, that a bending restraint is necessary to, <coughs> to form st stable helical structures, so stable structures in a biological environment. So what we do now is in addition to our HH contact and our HO contacts, for each 90 degree bend in the protein, we introduce an energetic penalty, so something that raises the energy of the system. So now our Hamiltonian is the HH contributions, the HO contributions, and then the angles. So it's just another layer. So the protein that I have been looking at is Crambin. And Crambin is a small, it's slightly hydrophobic protein and it's found in cabbage. Um, and that's not why it's interesting. It's interesting because it's short. So it's very short and it's relatively easy to model. There's experimental data. It has 400 atoms about but if we look at the amino acids, they're only 46. And that's a very short protein relative to all the others. And so this actually is the folded structure from, I guess, an x-ray crystallography experiment where the color code is the same as before. So if we look at the backbone interactions, consider the hydrophobic monomers gray, the neutral monomers white, polar monomers uh, orange. That's what it ends up looking like, folded. Of course, you can go into more detail with the atoms, but this is as close as we can get at this point to what we, to, to having something that looks like our model. So if we look at the mappings, we have an amino acid sequence given by the real amino acid sequence of Crambin. If we look at the HP mapping, 
So the HP mapping I will denote as HP 3D46, which will be important in a minute in the results. So HP is the HP model. 3D is three dimensions. 46 is 46 monomers. If you look at the mapping, that's it. It's just H's and P's, where the corresponding, mono, corresponding real amino acids are either more polar or more hydrophobic. We then look at the HOP mapping, where we now consider neutral monomers, H's and P's. It looks different. There are more letters. Um, but the interesting point is that if you look at the distribution of monomers, the HP model is slightly more polar. And so we know that it's a hydrophobic, slightly hydrophobic protein. And so that's already not, in, it's, it's not physical. It's not correct. So if we look at the HOP model, it is more hydrophobic than polar, but it is more neutral than either of the two. But we still at least recover that fact of the, of the real system. So to simulate these proteins, what we use is Wang-Landau sampling. And the, the motivation is that if we use traditional methods like Metropolis, they will fail at low temperatures or with systems with comp or in systems with complex free energy landscapes because of the Boltzmann factor. So you either have a large energy or a small temperature, and the probability goes down of accepting a move. So what we do in Wang Landau sampling, as we have seen, is that we take we make and we iteratively estimate the density of states of the system by performing a random walk in energy space. So by generating different configurations, comparing the densities of states. Over the course of the simulation, we generate, we converge to the true density of states of the system after many, many iterations, where each iteration converges in accordance to a flat histogram. So we've seen that a few times. And again, the key is that now the trial states are accepted with a probability that's related to the inverse of the density of states of the new state and not the Boltzmann factor. And so we don't need to worry about temperature dependence. So I'm not going to go through this because we've seen it a lot. Is that okay? Is that okay with everybody? Oh, I know it's not as exciting, but it's the same scheme, I promise. So, so let's say we do wang landau sampling and we have the the system properties, or the we have the density of states. If we want to get system properties, the benefit of having the density of states is we now know the partition function. And with the partition function, we can calculate any, the statistical mechanical average of any quantity that we want, quantity x. If the quantity x is energy, we can then calculate the specific heat through the fluctuations. Um, and then one specific property that I'm interested in this study is something that I will call the native fraction. And so at the ground state, there are certain monomers in contact with each other. So those would be the native contacts Right, the monomers that are in contact in the native state. If we then want to see how these change over the folding or over the unfolding, we need some way of measuring this. So the native fraction is just the ratio of, say, the HH contacts in state, energy state I, divided by the HH contacts, the exact HH contacts in the ground state. So not just the number. But if monomer 2 and 9 are connected in the ground state, then we would check if 2 and 9 are connected in the whatever energy state we want. So that gives us the fraction of the contacts that are the exact same in two different, in one state relative to the ground state. So again, a little different colors, but we've seen it before, right? So this is just an extension to Wang-Landau sampling. And the, the take home message is that we split the energy range up into different windows, and we can perform configurational exchanges between the energy ranges. And so we can, these walkers can converge independently, so that's one speed up. And then the other thing is that they can exchange configurations and get out of minima. Questions? Yeah. It's 3D. 3D, but but the so the angle it's only for a 90 degree. We don't consider torsional like yeah, orientational. So this we haven't seen. 
Um, a further extension to Wang-Landau sampling is now to sample in two-dimensional space. So instead of just having an energy, we now have an energy and some parameter q where we accumulate our density of states in, in the space of this, in this two-dimensional space. So it's the exact same procedure, but now our density of states is a function of two variables, and each walker will accumulate a subsection of this two-dimensional density of states. Um, in this schematic, the windows will overlap in both dimensions, but that would be very hard to show and it wouldn't make any sense. So it's not shown here. But in principle, this green walker can exchange with any one of these neighbors in a replica exchange. This allows us to obtain properties of our system as a function of energy and of parameter Q in, in one simulation. So we're interested in also the ground states and the structures that we get from the simulations. And so if we want to, to find what the ground state structures are, um, enumeration is impossible because the number of monomers is normally too high. So we can't just enumerate the states and find what the ground state looks like. So what we do is after we have our density of states from Wang Landau, we will resample from using this density of states, which is essentially multi-canonical sampling. Um, and then if we encounter a configuration that has the lowest energy, we translate the configuration into something called a sequence of directions. Yes. We did, but we don't keep track of that in the Wong Landau run. So we only keep track of uh, the energies. So if we want structural properties or ground state properties, we resample because it, takes, it would take too much space to store every property. From. Yeah, but we, we don't. Yeah. It's too much. It takes too much time and it takes too much space in one run. Well, well okay, yeah, so we store the energy. I mean, we store the energies, but we don't store the, s the sequences. The exact sequences. So we know what the lowest energy is. So we have to do it. We have to sample again. So f if we want structural properties or specific sequences, we resample. We run the simulation again, except now we know the density of states. So anyway, if we hit the lowest energy, or if we would we would transfer this or, or convert this into something called a sequence of directions, and all the information on how to do this can be found in this paper. Um, and what it is is that it's a, it's a way to account for symmetries in the system. And so if we hit two sequences that have a supposed different series of, a, a supposed different orientation, right? If it's rotated, one sequence is rotated from the other, but they have the same energy, and they're actually the same sequence, it's just the numbers or positions the way the computer stores it are different. We want to know if these are really the same sequence or if they're degenerate. And so what this does is it allows us to exactly know the sequences that are the ground state without degeneracy associated with symmetries. So we can keep searching for this as long as we'd like, and then after a certain amount of time, a certain predefined number of steps, or if states aren't found in a certain time, we can terminate the simulation and say that we have found all the states at the whatever energy we're looking at. And so normally this is the ground state energy, or traditionally, but you can do this for any energy level. So the sequence of directions is generic. If you hit the energy that you want, you can transform this into a sequence of directions and then keep searching for that energy. So. The next thing I want to talk about are the Monte Carlo trial moves that we used. Um, if we want to have an efficient and an accurate simulation, we need a good Monte Carlo algorithm and we need good trial moves, or else we'll either never converge or we'll never... The algorithm in this case would be Wang Landau, and then the trial moves would be the moves that we use to change the energy of the system. So in this case, we require that they're all reversible. So if we go from configuration A to configuration B, sorry, 
We can go back. <laughs> um, two broad categories are, are local trial moves and global trial moves. So local trial moves would, would change a portion of the chain, and global would change a larger portion of the chain. It's another question of scale. The first kind of move that we use is called a pivot move, and this is relatively common for lattice polymers. Um, but it's, it's, it has a very high rejection rate in dense configurations, and you will see why in a second. So let's say we have this protein. First thing we need to do is to choose a pivot point. So let's say monomer 4 is our pivot point. The next step, or the only step, is to perform a rotation around this point. Done. So that's our move. And that's, it's obvious why that could be rejected in dense configuration. Right? We can't have the protein overlap with itself. It's self-avoiding. The second kind of move is called a pull move. And this is the move that we use most often. And it's really sort of what makes everything work so well. Um, it can be local or global depending on the monomer that we choose randomly. So we choose one monomer randomly, pull, and then depending on which one this is, it either moves a small portion of the chain or a larger portion. So I will show you one specific case that I think gives you a good feel for how this move works. Let's say we choose monomer 6 as our random monomer. In this case, we would move monomer 6 and monomer 7 diagonally across their lattice squares, right, to the positions indicated here. But once we do that, we don't have a valid configuration, right, because the bond is too long between 7 and 8. So what we have to do then is pull the rest of the chain through the trajectory until we reach a valid configuration. And that's why it's called a pull move. So then we're done. This is our new configuration. Not correct. Why? Mm-hmm. Eight fills six. Okay. Well, so now you would pull up to here and then up. Okay. Okay. So we're still pulling monomers. The 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 idea is the same. <laughs> so, the last move that we use. Um, it's called a boundary bridging move. And so in this case, what we do is instead of moving monomers, physically moving them, we reconstruct the bonds. And this is very useful if we have densely packed systems. So the first step here is that we cut a set of parallel bonds. So let's say we cut the bond between 7 and 8 and 13 and 14. We can then reconstruct these between 7 and 14 and 8 and 13. But the problem now is that this is not connected. So we need to break another set of bonds, say between 2 and 3, 8 and 9, and reconstruct. 2 and 9, 3 and 8. So now we have a protein that's connected, but it's not ordered correctly. So we have to reorder the monomers. So this configuration is now very different we haven't moved, physically moved the monomers. So before I move on, I want to talk about a few details of the simulations. So we use Merzane Twister, random number generator. Yeah. Because these, well, because the sequence is defined by the actual protein. So we have to check if the monomers are the same. If it were if it were homopolymer, it wouldn't matter. So we use Merzane Twister random number generator. Uh, we generate the moves such that 75% are pull moves, 23 are bond bridging, and 2% are pivot. 
our flatness criterion to move on to the next iteration in Wong Landau is 80%. So that means that the minimum entry in our histogram has to be 80% of the average. Um, the minimum modification factor that we use to know when the simulation terminates, when we've converged, is e to the 10 to the minus 8. Um, for error bar estimates, we've used at least three runs for each set of data, in most cases more than that. Um, and to give you an idea of the simulation time for two-dimensional replica exchange Wong Landau, um, I was using 24 cores for one run, five runs, two weeks per run, it's 40,000 core hours. So that's only for, the, only for that one part. But that's the most intensive, normally. So for results, if we look at just the original HP model, um, and in this case, the interaction parameters are up here. So the HH contact strength is just one. And we have no other contacts, right? Because we don't have neutral monomers, and we don't consider angles. Um, this is exactly what's shown here. It's just more clear up top. So if you look at the specific heat curve as a function of temperature, we know that these proteins should fold in two steps. Um, and in this case, each sort of peak or bump or signal in the specific heat indicates some sort of structural change, a large structural change. So we see that there's clearly one peak and then a small shoulder, right? So there are two sort of transitions, um, but the second one is not very clear. If we look at the, the log of the density of states over the energy range, the curve looks fine, believable, but the degeneracy, ground state degeneracy, is 5.9 times 10 to the fifth states. And so that's one of the major problems with this model. So that's way too high to be reasonable. It should be one. Um, if we then look at the HOP model, where we now add the neutral monomer, so now we have an HH strength of 1 again and an HO strength of a half. So half as large as the HH contact strength. The specific heat now, the red curve here, shows two distinct steps, right? Two distinct signals. And so we recover the two-step folding. And then the density of states now and the ground state degeneracy, the curve looks similar, but the ground state degeneracy is 121. So there are 121 states with the lowest energy, configuration with the lowest energy. Um, and this is much better than 5.9 times 10 to the fifth, but it's also very far from 1. So we can do better. For the angle interaction energy, instead of trying every possible interaction, what we want to do is to be able to know exactly how this interaction strength influences the folding for any, any interaction energy that we specify. And this is where we can use two-dimensional replica exchange Wong Landau sampling. So what we do is we sample in terms of the contact energy as well as the number of angles. So if we know the contact energy and the number of angles, we can reweight the energies for any angle energy times the number of angles that we have. And we can find the impact that the angle interaction has on the folding process for all values of this energy. Yes. So this is no energy. This is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, yes. But in this case, we don't. So that is important. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is, we don't have a unique function. So and now we have, OK, so as, as before, we have the temperature, specific heat. But now we have a variable angle energy. So the sign is negative because it increases the energy of the system. So this is the stiffness. And what we can see is that for all values up until the point where the angle energy is equal and opposite to the HO contact strength, we still get two bumps. So there's still two tra transitions, right? And this is what we still expect. But for certain values, say around here, so 0 0.05, and around here, so 0.35 or so, um, there's a third signal. So something happens very close to the ground state. 
And there are no error bars here, but they are right here. So if we zoom in on the case where the angle energy is 0.05, so that's the lower, the one closer to you in the previous slide, um, there is clearly a third bump. So that's with error bars. Um, and the HH strength and the HO strength are the same, but the angle energy is very small, and we get a third transition signal. And the density of states now looks different. It's sawtooth pattern because of this low, very, very low interaction energy relative to the other terms. The most, well, in my opinion, the most interesting thing is that there is a unique ground state. So there's only one structure that has this lowest energy state. So even though it's not a unique function of theta, there's only one state that has the lowest energy. And the state is that. And so it, this is what it looks like. Um, obviously, we can't compare this really to theory because it's a lattice model. But we do still have a hydrophobic core. And that's essentially where the model began, was to simulate the effects or to, to use our knowledge of how proteins fold to uh, reconstruct this idea of, of folding to a hydrophobic core. And so we don't lose that, but we do introduce a few physically motivated modifications and, and obtain a unique ground state. The last thing I want to talk about are native contacts. And so if we look at this, uh, the same structure, right? So that one structure has a unique set of native contacts and angles. And so if we look at, so the native fraction shown here um, as a function of the energy, so the lowest energy state, this is 24.7 or something, has a native contact, native fraction of one because all of the contacts that are in that state are in that state, right? So that's, that's where we start. If we increase the energy, if we look at the native contacts as a function of the energy, the triangles here are the HO contacts, boxes are the HH contacts, and the circles are the number of angles, you can see that at a certain point, there's a huge change in this fraction. And so what does that do to? If we look at the specific heat again as a function of temperature, and we look at the average energy as a function of temperature. You can see that at whatever, 24.7, if we look at the energy axis, it's down here, corresponds exactly to this signal. And so this third transition is completely due to the formation of these native contacts. So the structure doesn't look that different, but the internal rearrangement is huge, a very large change. So in summary, we've studied Cranbin because it's straightforward, using slight refinements to the original HP model. Um, but we still retain the simplicity associated with using a lattice model. If we use two-dimensional replica exchange Wong Landau sampling, we can identify certain interesting values of this angle interaction using only one simulation. So we can find where we want to look next just using a single simulation. We reduce the ground state degeneracy by five orders of magnitude from the original HP model, obtain a ground state, and find that the formation of native contacts is the cause of this transition, so the third signal in the specific heat. For the future, um, what I did not say, because there's no time to explain all of this, is that there, this range 0.35, 0.4, and 0.45 all also have a unique ground state. And it's the same unique ground state. And the first excited state is also unique and also the same among these interactions. So there is a stable, a more stable regime, I guess, of this interaction energy. So questions, and, and so the specific heat, there's obviously a signal here. And the native contacts are even more dramatic. There's an even larger change in native contacts. Uh, at, this, at the position of this signal. And so the questions then are, how resistant is this ground state to mutation? So what if we change an H monomer to a O? Or if we change an O to a P or a P to an H or whatever, any combination, how resistant is this to mutation? Do we get the same ground state? Do we get a different ground state? Do we get a degenerate ground state? 
So that's one thing to look at. And then the other thing is how similar are results if we move off lattice. So what happens off lattice? Do we get a third signal? Obviously, there would probably be a unique ground state. Yeah, <laughs> of course. So, uh, yeah, so that's so then this first question another graduate student's looking at currently. And then for the future, I want to I wanna take this off lattice and see what happens, actually using the algorithm that Yingwei talked about, so the continuum, binless Wang Landau sampling. Um, so acknowledgments are computing resources and then the APS SBF exchange program for sending me here and to all of you for your attention. So thanks. <laughs>